everyone how are you it is Saturday November 27th 2021 this is episode 225 I want to welcome you to this place this is woolen spinning my name is Rachel um, I can be found pretty much everywhere as sort of wool and spinning or well for pearls well for pearls is sort of my like username if you will wool and spinning is more like the stuff for the podcast so on Instagram I've changed my username from well for pearls to wool and spinning so you might have noticed that but on Ravelry I'm still well for pearls welcome everybody um to new viewers of the show and you're just checking this out thank you so much for checking out the show and for seeing what we do here and what goes on here for those who are returning viewers thank you so much for continuing to watch the show week in week out if you don't mind taking a moment to hit the like and subscribe button that would be wonderful and welcome to our patreon community who is of course just going crazy in the chat thank you so much you guys you kicked off early this morning Shauna said she couldn't sleep she'd been up for hours and we've got lots and lots of people here today. Already the chat is moving so fast I can barely keep up. I actually just had a look at the chat as I was getting everything organized. And I was like, oh, I'll pop in and say hello to everybody and blah, blah, blah. And then um, it was just moving too quickly. <laughs> I was like, nope, I have to do my stuff to get ready to stream the show with you guys. So um, it's just really good to see everybody. So, And then at the last minute, I realized that I had already drunk my cup, of, my mug of tea already. And um, it was basically empty. So I like ran into the kitchen, filled up my mug. I had to microwave it. It was cold. But it's good now. So I had to fill up. Because my I, I do find by the end of the hour, uh, my voice is dry. And I do find that just all the talking and everything that I do kind of run out of that voice stamina. I used to teach swimming lessons and we would teach in the pool, in the water for like four to six hours at a time. It was a long time. This was when I was between the ages of 16 and about 22, 23 was when I stopped teaching. And that was actually when they started cutting the teaching shifts back to only two or three hours instead of four to six hours. So there were days, especially on like a Saturday morning, I would start at 7 a.m., and I wouldn't be getting out of the water until like one, two in the afternoon. And my voice was just wrecked. And I walked around for like six years, seven years, just really, really croaky. And um, I think I think there was actually like sustained damage to my to my voice. So I do find that I run out of my voice runs out a lot sooner than other people. And I think it's that damage from teaching in the pool and yelling and um, teaching swim club and being up on the up on the deck and yelling down into the water and I mean you don't know what you don't know at age 18 19 and they didn't know our employer so anyhow super interesting so good morning everybody we've got lots of people in the chat that that are our regulars it's so good to see you guys welcome to anybody who is new to the chat and new to patreon this past couple of weeks couple of you know couple months and just kind of finding their finding their um, their flow and their their place it's so good to have you guys here so thank you I have been working on like the weirdest mix of projects this past week. I've had like 20 minutes here, 30 minutes there, an hour here, like just kind of weird kind of and and just kind of getting like a little bit of everything done. So I thought I would just go through kind of just a smattering of what I've been working on. And I also really want your guys' feedback on something. Um, it's about my sweater that's in the background. I'm just not loving the button band and I wanted, I'm wearing this sweater for a reason. Um, it's the Acer by Amy Christopher's, Christopher's, however you say her last name. And I wanted to talk um, about sort of my thoughts around these two sweaters. So yeah, we've got lots of stuff going on. Welcome to everybody and we'll run the credits and we'll just get like right into the show.
So Nora's upstairs doing her schoolwork. And that's actually why there has been um, just an unbelievable amount of sort of, um, you know, little bits of time here and there this week because both of the kids are at the end of term and they had, um, James had three major final projects for the term and Nora had two major final projects for the term. So she actually finished hers a couple of days ago and then my mom, bless her heart, came over yesterday so that James could finish his stuff. So she sat with Nora and proofread all of Nora's stuff. So that was wonderful because it made Nora go back through her stuff and look at it once again. And James and I could sit in the school room, which used to be our office where we used to stream the podcast. Um, we've turned it into a school room and it's slowly being morphed into a study. It's going to have book, built in bookshelves and I'll take you guys on a tour. Once it's all done, I will take you on a tour of the house. And um, so in the school room, James and I could sit at his Chromebook. Um, that was something that we had to buy for the kids. Um, we, uh, um, with this blended program, there is so much that is done through online so that the kid, so the teachers can distribute all of the learning. That's why it's called distributed learning for the week. And so with my Chromebook and the desktop, they're just literally wasn't enough screens because the kids don't have their own iPads or anything like that. So um, I said to Mike, I'm like, you know, as soon as they come on sale, like I really think we need Chromebooks for the kids. It's been a game changer. So James and I sat in the schoolroom yesterday afternoon and he actually, I couldn't believe it. He worked for about six hours yesterday and banged out his projects and got them done. And they're not rushed. They're actually, he did a really beautiful job. So it's been wonderful. Um, yeah, Eve says, yes, I want to see your house. I'm so nosy. Absolutely. So we are in the process of, we were going to do it ourselves. We started off doing it ourselves. Mike has already done the upstairs. Um, he's finished sort of that section of the project. And we've both agreed that it would actually be a better use of our time since it's not a renewable resource um, to actually invest the money and just get it, get the rest of the house done. So that's what we're, we're just researching right now. We're looking for, um, somebody, a contractor that can just like do it for us and get it done. So, cause with the kids and me home all the time right now, we just need to make some changes. So up and coming, uh, hence the constantly trying to clean out the house. Um, somebody was asking about the weather in BC. Um, yes, we've had an atmospheric river going on. Atmospheric rivers happen all over the world all the time. It just so happens that what's happened here is we have had this atmospheric river. We've had this mud and rain event. That's what they're calling it. Um, where we got all of the rainfall that we would normally get in the month of November in one day. So that was last Monday. It was a week, a, a week ago. Um, uh, this, this, so it was almost two weeks ago tomorrow. And, um, what's ended up happening is mass evacuations. People have lost their homes. CN rail is, was washed out in parts. So there's no, um, there's, there, there's light rail going now, but like there's a fuel shortage, there's a food shortage. Um, it's affecting everybody who lives in the greater Vancouver area. We're basically cut off from the rest of the province and the rest of the province is cut off from us. Um, so it's been really fun. <laughs> Um, $30 max to put for, to, to put fuel in your car. All of the gas stations that are up near us are all out of fuel. Diesel's gone. Um, you walk into the grocery stores, the shelves are empty. It's almost kind of like COVID all over again, but this, this is, this feels a bit worse. This feels a bit more like Armageddon-y kind of. Um, I'm not, I'm not being like dramatic. It's just been, this has been really hard on people. Um, and there's a lot of people that are going back into homes that they don't know what they're going back into. They don't know kind of what the damage is. Um, uh, both of Mike's bosses, they lost their homes. So like his, his, the CEO, like the piano is in the like entryway of their business of, of like the, where they come into, to the business because like they had to get it out. So anyways, heartbreaking stuff. Um, heartbreaking. All right. Um, why don't we talk about weaving first, just because it's the easiest for me to access here and the easiest for me to talk about. Um, and I wanted to share with you, can I share with you guys something? I, I'm laughing at myself a little bit because it goes to show you how overwhelmed you can get. Uh, and you kind of develop like these mental blocks about things and you're sort of like, I'm, I'm kind of surprised <laughs> that I, that I kind of, it put up this mental block that I thought something was so incredibly complicated. And then coming back to it two years later, I was like, 
really? So let me show you. I have wanted to weave these towels for a really long time. It was a free download um, that I had found. And um, so it was a Google image search that I, I just typed in candy cane towels. And I was basically just looking for um, a towel pattern that would be super easy um, that I could throw onto the loom that would be kind of Christmassy. I could adjust the colors if I wanted to. And um, this was the Christmas after my dad had died. So my dad had died like a couple of months before. I wanted to do something kind of festive. Um, I was just getting started on the floor loom and I found this. And I looked at it and my immediate thought was, that's way too complicated. I like the colors. I don't love the purple, but I'll change it out. And um, I saved the image and put it into a, like just a weaving file of like inspiration and kind of an ongoing visual, visual journal. And I didn't look at it again. So I think what the hiccup was, was the threading. I think that was what was the issue. I think it was the fact that it went from straight draw to a point twill to a straight draw to a point twill. And it was changing direction every kind of, you know, 10 or 12, um, threads where it was going this way at one point and then it goes to this way and then it goes to this way and just looking at it and glancing at it I was like that's too complicated and the treadling is too complicated and the tie up is too complicated and blah 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 so that was two years ago and um I, I came back to it this fall because I was like I really want to do those Christmas towels I should look at it again I wonder if I could figure it out now knowing you know what I knowing what I know, my knowledge has grown, you know, just exponentially. Um, maybe, maybe I could figure them out. Maybe, maybe the eight shaft pattern isn't as complicated as I thought that it was. Well, first of all, it's not an eight shaft pattern. It's a four shaft pattern. <laughs> and secondly, it's two, two, 12. <laughs> it's treadling one, two, two, three, three, four, four, one. So it goes to show you that when you're first looking at this stuff, it really is incredibly complicated and it really is just an unbelievable amount of stuff to learn. And the fact that we sort of take the time to figure this out and learn this stuff and we build on, you know, each project builds on itself and each project builds on the previous project goes to show you that when I went and glanced at this again, I was like, oh my goodness, Rachel, if you had just taken a moment and the, that fall is such a blur. Um, you probably could have figured this out. However, it's kind of neat because now James is old enough that he could kind of jump in. And we put this into Fiberworks. And um, you have to pay for Fiberworks. It's a, it's a weaving um, sort of software program. And you have to pay for it if you want the full capability of it. Um, but you can do some designing and you can do kind of basic stuff without actually purchasing it. And then you can take a screenshot um, of sort of what you've done. So what I said to James was, I'm not really sure. Um, I don't love that purple that's in there. You see how every other candy cane is purple? Because these are meant to be candy canes, okay? Vision candy canes. And then I kind of think of the green as being sort of like holly. Um, and I, so I wanted to take out the purple. So I said to James, I took it out and I said, you know, what do you think? Like, why don't you start playing around with the color bar at the top and just see what you like? Cause he is such a whiz with color. And I feel like the more I involve the kids, the more I get them sort of, you know, excited about this stuff, they'll want to do some of it as well. Maybe not weaving, maybe not knitting, maybe not spinning, but other things. So he started playing around and this is what he came up with. So it ended up just being the red and the green alternating, which was kind of what I thought I would do, but he played with like teal to make it a really modern Christmas. So taking out that green and he put in a teal to make it sort of a, more of a, like, like I said, like a modern Christmas. Um, he put in gold, he took out the red, he switched the red and the green, but he said he really liked the candy cane being the red and the white. The thing is that makes these towels really worthwhile is that your tie up is super straightforward. It's two, two, twelve, one, two, one, two, two, three, three, four, four, one. Um, your tie up is a little bit more complicated. You're going, you know, from a straight draw to a point twill, and then you're going the other way. And then, you know, um, so sort of a variation on sort of an undulating twill kind of an idea. But then when you get to the weaving, it's, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, for 
three yards, six yards, nine yards, however long you want to make your warp. And then you just cut your towels where you want to cut them. So that's actually what I'm going to do. So I've wound a six yard warp and I'm going to, you know, lash on and I'll just start weaving. And, um, from there, I'll just weave the length of the warp and then I'll cut them apart later. So I'm hoping to get six out of it. If I can, um, weave as far along the length of the warp as possible, like right to the very end kind of thing. And then from there, um, I'll just cut them apart post washing and finishing. So, um, I'll cut them off. I'll, I'll surge the top and the bottom of the warp and I'll wash them and I'll cut them apart later. So that's my plan. So, um, I've got, so I've got the warp done. So here is the warp. It's sitting in a basket here. Sorry, you lost me for a minute. Um, the other camera was um, off because I was recording some stuff earlier. So um, I did not chain it. Um, this is not a chained warp. I follow um, a lot of Laura Fry's uh, recommendations that she has kind of worked out for herself and that really work for her in, I think it's called The Intentional Weaver. Um, it's on blurb. It's a, uh, you can download it as a PDF or you can purchase it as a book. If somebody could actually take a minute, um, and put the link in, in the live chat for her book, that would be awesome. Um, she, that book is just full of, um, thoughts and ideas and she works with, um, uh, um, I think she has an ongoing back injury or she's had back injuries in the past. Um, and so a lot of her, the way that she does things, this is Laura Fry, um, the way that she does things, um, she's modified a lot of it. So like how she uses a warping board, how she, how she does her warps, what she does with them after she's made them, how she gets them onto the loom. It's really, really fascinating. So I read the book about two years ago and a lot of it just went over my head. Like I, I felt like I was just reading you know, um, words on a page. And now going back to her book again and rereading some of those sections has been really great. But one of the big things was, um, not, not spending the time chaining. Um, so I think it's called the intentional weaver. If somebody has five minutes to, or two minutes or whatever, just to like throw it in, um, to the live chat, the link, that would be awesome. Um, but basically what I do is at the very top of my cross, and Laura Fry is a production weaver. Um, so she's really cranking out long warps, big warps, huge amount of, amounts of them. And she's doing the same thing over and over and over again. So when she shares her process and shares her knowledge, um, I feel like it's really, um, re really well kind of, you know, um, um, it's tried and true. The other thing um, is that she, um, talks about doing things seven times. So you hear sort of the conventional wisdom of doing things, um, um, three times. So the first time you're learning it, the second time you're reinforcing it and the third time you make it your own. Um, so if anybody hasn't heard that, that's sort of like a, um, you know, a creative way of sort of approaching how you do things. Um, she says seven times when it comes to weaving. And I think the reason for that is that the first few times you're kind of working out all the kinks, you're figuring out the mechanics, you're kind of going through all of the stuff. And then, um, you're going the next, you know, two or three times you're sort of getting into a rhythm and getting into emotion. And then the last two or three times you make it your own. Um, and you know, the idea is by the, um, you know, by the end of that seventh time that you've warped, for example, you really know it. You can warp, you know, in that way really well, very quickly. Um, and so that's certainly been, been the, the way it's been for me. So what I do at the top of the cross, this is the cross here. I've got it all tied. Um, and then at the, at the top of the cross to make sure I don't lose where my crosses are when I put it into the basket, I do two, um, tie extra ties. Um, so that I can, and I leave those hanging out of the basket so that I can just grab them and I know where they are. So, um, that is how I do that and keep that organized. Um, I've warped in two, eight cotton. It's red and this sort of limey green that I had that I, you know, thought was okay. It's very Grinch stole Christmas kind of colors. Not my first choice, 
It's what I had in my in my sort of stash, uh, quote unquote, and then white um, in between, and it'll be a white weft. So woven at uh, 22 ends per inch, um, hopefully 22 picks per inch for a really nice cloth. I had done some tutu twill towels last summer. Um, they the, they were the Swedish rainbow towels that I had done, and um, I wove them at 20 ends per inch. I think I was just playing around with the tutu twill and kind of you know I was like, oh, I don't need to set it that that high. Um, I'll just set it at 20, and uh, they're not wearing that well. Um, and so I was talking to my weaving mentor about that, and she was like, yeah. 2-8 cotton, it really needs to be at like 22 or 24. And if you can't beat hard enough to keep it 24 and 24 on twill and get that nice 45 degree angle, go to 22 and see what happens. So I'm going to try 22 with these and just see, and then I'll be able to assess the wear and compare the two towels over time. These won't get used as much because of being for Christmas, but um, it'll be really fun to see them. And then the other weaving that I just pulled off um, it looks like you guys are having trouble posting the link. Um, I like the Grinch green with the red. Thank you, Jennifer. I really appreciate that. Um, and uh, Charlotte uh, posted a link for the for the Laura Fry book in, in uh, Slack. And I'll try to remember, um, and if I don't throw a comment in on YouTube, I'll try to remember to update the uh, show notes and throw them in there, throw a link in there. So she has a second book as well. It's called Magic in the Water. And it's uh, a written it's the written sort of form of her final project for her GCW Master Weaver uh, certificate. So Magic in the Water is her other book and it's all about finishing, um, which is for was for her Master Weaver. So these are my finished towels. I actually have, there's eight of these in total. Um, these are my, my color, my, my rainbow color gamp from um, Jane Stafford. So this was part of the online guild. I'm just gonna move over a little bit so that I can talk. Um, these two are completely finished. I've got the other ones are, they're all hemmed, but they've got, I found after washing and finishing, there was a couple of skips that I needed to fix. So they're on my, on my, um, uh, ironing board right here. Actually. Um, I just need to fix a couple of skips, but they turned out really well. I'll just put on the big camera so that you guys can see and I can hold it up. So this is the right side. So these ended up turning out, they're not super big, um, to go through the kind of color repeat, if you will. They go, you can see the, the clean color goes from here and it goes on a diagonal. So if you can see, it goes uh, violet, violet blue, uh, royal, uh, um, uh, uh, royal blue, and then it goes uh, blue, lighter blue, and then the clean blue. So it goes on, an, on a diagonal all the way down the towel, all the way down to the red. So if you can, if I hold these up, you'll be able to see that um, sort of go through the whole towel. What I really like about them is if you look, if you kind of look from a distance, you can actually see, and I'm going to have to hold it in my mouth so that I can point it out to you guys. There's almost like a cross in there. Of the lighter colors. So it creates like, um, like a watercolor effect almost, which I just, I think is really, really pretty. Um, I just really like that. So it goes all the way through from red down here at the one hem all the way up to the violet at the other end. And honestly, it's just eight towels of that. <laughs> and then when you fold them into thirds, which I really like tea towels folded into thirds. And the reason is because it hides the selvage. So even though generally my selvages tend to be quite good, I just really like the clean look of a towel hung in thirds. I don't know why. My friend Miriam used to do it. She used to always hang her towels, her hand towels, her bath towels, her tea towels. They were always hung in thirds and at her at her apartment. And she lived in this like really, really crappy little apartment. And she was always complaining about it. And there was mold and there was silverfish and it was just like not a really nice apartment. And she didn't have any money. She was still a student. And her and I, you know, I just met Mike. We, we were just engaged and um, we, uh, and so I go over to her place and we all kind of felt like we were still university students. We were still kind of getting on our feet. We were all in our early twenties and you go to her house and all of her towels were beautifully folded. It was always as clean as she could possibly get the apartment. And it just stuck with me. Fold your towels in thirds. <laughs> I know it's just the silliest thing, but isn't that pretty, you know, hanging, hanging in your, in your kitchen. So the other way, obviously, that you can hang them is in half. It's just that you see the selvage, which is fine. 
The salvage isn't bad, but I don't know. I don't think it looks as pretty. That's just me. So anyhow, these are them and I've got eight of them and they, I've, I've earmarked, um, I've earmarked them for, uh, most of them are going to be gifts. I am going to keep two for my, for our, for us, um, because they're just so happy and it was supposed to be a gamp. Um, to look at the different colors and how the different colors play across one another. So one of the really neat things about this is that if you um, sort of look across the warp, like this is the yellow, the green, and the orange against each other. So like if you kind of hone in on some of those sections, you can really see how you can get some really, really amazing effects. Um, this one here is one of my favorites. It's orange, green, and blue. Um, that is that yellow, green, and blue, or yellow, green, and orange one. Um, this one's really neat too. It's the green, yellow, and red, and orange. So you've got four colors in there. Um, so some of them you've got, because of the color blend, so this is clean yellow in the warp. This is clean green in the warp and then you've got one thread of each in this square so then when you come across along with your weft where you've got one pick of each color as well as you work through your rainbow you get these just really really cool effects and you can see how it changes whether or not you see more warp or whether or not you see more weft so this is very yellow this one's kind of very balanced of the yellow and the and the um and the green and then this one becomes more green because this is clean green which you can see here and this one is the clean yellow and then this one's a combination of all four so one pick of yellow one pick of green in the warp and then one pick of yellow one pick of green in the weft so you get these different effects isn't that cool so this you get like that very checked pattern and up here rather than getting a checked pattern you get sort of like a dots sort of effect and then here you get like a tic-tac-toe isn't that fantastic so it's been really neat looking through all of them and really taking a few minutes before they go into sort of circulation if you will before they go into use um, to really kind of get an idea of how these colors play in the dark section where you've got the purples and the blues it's quite challenging to, to sort of see much of a difference so that the, the changes become very subtle and that's really cool as well so yeah so this one is one of my other ones I made this one slightly longer um, so it goes from the red all the way back to the red so this one was a little bit longer and um, there's a skip in this one so there's a couple of these that I have to go back and fix and I'll rewash and re-iron them and it'll be fine. So that's how they turned out. So yeah, Dana folds in thirds as well. I'm going to start this whole thing of like, do you fold your towels in thirds? <laughs> it's going to be like a thing. Yeah, Dana says, love those towels. Um, color gaps are so much fun. They really are. Um, Kelly says, I hang all my towels in thirds and people are always removing them and folding them in half and it just does not look as nice. My sister-in-law does that. It drives me batty. So like whenever we're over there, like she really uses my towels. Like she, I have to give her credit. She really uses them. They don't get put away. She really uses them. But it drives me batty. <laughs> it's like batty. Because um, I feel like there's also for us, in our, and, I, I, and I can say that because, say this because I'm surrounded by other people who are makers. I think there's a... I think we kind of have a reverence for our handmade items and I think for other people who aren't necessarily handmakers whatever that is there's just not that same reverence and um, like my mom always looks after the towels that I give her she folds them in thirds she irons them like she doesn't iron any of her other tea towels um, but she'll press them because she's a sewist so the irons always on and uh, she'll give them a quick press and she presses them into thirds so that there's a like a, a fold line and you know and it's because she's a maker and she really gets it so yeah all right um and tp over oh my gosh you guys are so funny now you're gonna start a whole thing about toilet paper 
Um, I did a little bit of spinning this week, so let's get into spinning. We've talked lots about weaving. I know not everybody is a weaver. Um, this was my Rolex that I had made. We sent out some of these for Spindle Spun Summer, and um, do you remember James had played with them, and he had started to um, draft them out because he thought that I was going to use them. So I spun these in our Maker Morning this past Wednesday, which was really lovely to see everybody. Thank you so much for being there. And... Um, I've got it wound into a center pull ball to to actually ply. I was going to do it this morning before the show, but I thought I don't want to rush and I don't actually have a wheel free right now to actually ply, if you can believe. So I'll do this later this afternoon. I'm actually really looking forward to it. I haven't made any substantial progress on my hearth uh, spinning. This is on the e-spinner. This is the hearth colorway from the School of Sweet Georgia. I bought this um, right at the beginning of COVID lockdowns with Rebecca and Felicia. It was the last time we got into the studio before COVID kind of shut everything down. It was on the day that Rebecca was flying home. So um, uh, I started spinning this. This is uh, go going to be a total of eight ounces. So this is the first four ounces going on to this bobbin right now. And I'm really curious to see if I can get a full eight ounces on this bobbin. So what I'll do is when I finish that first four ounces, I'll put some fiber in between, probably a big chunk of something that I'll feel as I come across it and spin that on just like a big chunk of something and then I'll start the this the second four ounces and see if I can actually get a full eight ounces onto the onto the e-spinner. I've done six before I've just never sort of done a full eight ounce spin onto the e-spinner and I'm pretty sure that I that I can do it. The colorway and what it looked like in the braid was in the um, in the intro credits. We have been spinning this wood, white faced woodland llama, a Ramey and bamboo blend on um, the wool circle. So we were working on this a couple of Tuesdays ago and it's only 84 grams. It was a steal of a deal. It was less than $10 uh, Canadian to purchase. So like American, that would have been like what, five, six dollars if that. It is proving to be quite challenging to spin. I am really enjoying it. So I just uh, finished um, a half of a half of the first bobbin. I've still got, uh, so what I did was I, I divided this into two. So it ended up being 42 grams per bobbin was what I was gonna do. Um, it won't actually be a bobbin change probably. What I'll end up doing is I'll just spin it all to one bobbin with some fiber in between so I know where to stop when I'm rewinding onto, onto uh, storage bobbins. Um, and then I took the first 22 grams and we started playing with it on the wool circle and I just, you know, did sort of what I normally do to get started with a fiber and just sort of start to learn it. Um, you will understand why I'm putting this silk down in just a moment. Um, I sort of, you know, did what I always do and I just started, you know, sort of finding the natural breaks in the comb top and started sort of pulling it apart and took a little bit off so that I could start spinning a little sample on the wool circle and we worked through that at the wheel. Afterwards, as I was continuing to spin, you can see how flyaway this fiber is. It gets on everything. It sticks to your jeans, it sticks to your sweater, it sticks to your shirt, um, it goes on the floor. It's just there's nothing to kind of hold it together. Even the white-faced woodland isn't enough because it's not super wash white-faced woodland, it's, it's wool. Um, it's, it just, there's not enough to hold it together. There's no percentages on here. So I don't know what the percentages are of all of these fibers, but I suspect that between the four fibers, they're probably pretty evenly matched because this doesn't feel wooly at all. It feels more bast than anything, bast fiber. So what I ended up doing was I stripped it down like this to about the width of my pointer finger. And um, I very, very, very gently pre-drafted and added a little twist just to hold it together. And I ended up putting it on a distaff. So the other day for um, when we were in our OHS uh, group meeting for our Master Weaver on, on Thursday, I was seeing her spinning off of the distaff. And that's actually been really enjoyable. And it's made me really enjoy spinning this fiber. Um, because it's just something different, right? Just do things a little bit differently and enjoy the process. So now what I need to do later today, I'm hoping I get a chance. I'm working tomorrow, so I may, I may not, but, um, and I'm teaching this afternoon, um, a second part of a workshop. So, um, 
what I'm hoping to do is actually to get this the rest of this 22 grams stripped down, pre-drafted, loaded onto the distaff um, so that I can continue on spinning. This is on my Lendrum that I'm spinning it actually. It's right here. Um, the reason was actually just for the wheel was free and um, I wasn't actually doing any active teaching on that wheel at the moment. And so I ended up just using the Lendrum and at 17 to one, it's been absolutely perfect. My plan is to make a two ply and um, I'm really hoping to have this for weaving. Um, I'd like to dye it first and then and then weave with it. So yeah. All right. My mother-in-law knit her four sons each a sweater when they were boys, which she rarely let them wear for fear of them wrecking it. Oh my goodness, Jennifer, I have heard that from other people before. It makes me laugh every time. Um, you know, it, it's, uh, it's a really tough, it's tough, right? I have the sweaters that I knit for the kids when they were babies and I have all their toques and whatnot. And there's a part of me that's like, maybe I should just donate them. And then there's this other part of me that's like, well, it'd be nice to give them to them so their kids can wear it. But are they really going to wear it when they're, when they have kids? I don't know. So a couple of them we put on their stuffies and if they get wrecked, they get wrecked. Um, but at least they're kind of being used. Um, Jennifer says I use my nice crystal wine glasses for the same reason if they break in use then it means they have been loved and used and yep I'll have to replace a couple you know it's funny Jennifer that you would say that because you know I I felt like when I first I I was one of the rare people in my in my sort of group of friends and, and in my family that asked for China when we got married and um, I only bought a set of eight and I always kind of afterwards wondered if it was the right thing to do because it ended up kind of in the closet, in the cupboards for the first couple of years. But I'm actually really glad I did in the end um, because it's stuff that we've used so far, touch wood and blue, nothing's broken. And I've just really appreciated having it and being able to pull it out at Christmas and Thanksgiving, although we go camping on Thanksgiving, um, but at, you know, special occasions. And um, we pull out the crystal with it as well. And it's, uh, it's just been kind of fun to have it, you know, and to use it. And like, we really use it. All right, this is Yustava um, by Joanna um, Hytala. I hope I'm saying that correct. Uh, Jonah Hytala. Um, Yustava is a, um, as you can see, it's a top-down raglan. It's a textured waffle weave type knitting pattern. Uh, it's very intuitive. So once you go through the first couple of sort of repeats of the pattern, you memorize it and you can just go. And now that I'm on the sleeve, I actually don't even have the pattern in front of me. I just am doing it by, by memorization because it's, it's very intuitive. This yarn is quite heavy. So this is Estelle Yarns. Uh, it's a, a llama worsted um, weight. It's, got, it's, a, it's a llama merino blend. Um, it's quite heavy. I think once I wash it and block it and whatnot, it's going to be quite, it's gonna, it's going to grow. This cardigan, like I mentioned at the beginning of the show, um, let me see if I can show you the, the button band. The button band was sewn on. So I did a one by one rib and I sewed it on all the way up to the um, collar. So you can see that at the top of the collar here, it just blends right in and the button band just kind of comes up and finishes off the sweater. And then I sewed on buttons on this side, but this sweater actually doesn't have button holes. And the reason for that was because um, I actually kind of forgot about them. I was eight and a half months pregnant and um, I was just knitting on autopilot. And I was quite uncomfortable at that point. So this is gonna grow quite a lot um, in the washing. My, my swatch, which I don't have right here, was, was quite, quite hefty when it was finished and it grew quite a bit in the washing process. This, the original sweater you actually hold with a mohair. So it gives this textured pattern sort of a bit of a, a fuzzy appearance, which is really, really lovely. But I thought, you know what, this yarn is gauge and um, it's got that little bit of a halo because of the merino and the, sorry, because of the llama. Um, and I just kind of want to see what happens. Um, I don't love the merino mohair kind of look on me it's not, I've done a couple of sweaters now with it and it's not my favorite um, so this kind of ended up being what I decided to do what I am pausing about is the button band so I pinned them so that you guys would really be able to see 
but I followed the instructions with the pattern and I did the knitted collar and then I picked up for the button band and this is the side where the buttons go. Um, I kind of decided that because as I was knitting it, I was like, I'm not sure I really like this. So I'm just going to knit it straight and cast off so that I can see what it looks like. And I'll put button holes on the other side if I, if I continue to go along with this method. But what do you guys think? Do you think the sewn button band would be better on this or do you, or do you like this twisted rib at the front? And there's twisted rib down here and then there's twisted rib on the, on the, on the cuffs. I'm really torn. I feel like it would really finish the sweater beautifully if it was a sewn button band, but I also, because I don't love this up here, I don't love that transition and love that. So then the other part of me was like, well, maybe I take this back, do the button band, and then pick up the collar all the way along. Uh, Dana says she likes the twisted rib. Vicky says she likes the twisted. Um... I don't know, what do, you, do you guys like the look of it? Like, does it look right to you? I always think this doesn't look right. How you have the collar and then the button band like that. Like, I just don't love it. Um, Eve says she likes the button band that's there. Rebecca says she likes the horizontal look with the textured pattern. Okay, you guys are saying you like it as is. It looks more rustic with twisted, which complements the texture. I like it. It looks like it frames the sweater. It looks right, says Dana. Yeah, it, it, Kelly says if it doesn't look right to you, you should totally change it. The thing is, there's going to be a button here, right? Like there's a button that goes here. So I just wanted to know what you guys thought because I, I kind of, I cast it off the other night and I was like, I wonder, I just, I don't know. But that's really helpful if you guys, um, if you guys think that it looks, it kind of looks right. Like if, if you think it looks right, then I'm happy to leave it. I just wasn't sure, to be honest. I was just kind of like, I don't know. I don't know if this looks right or not. <laughs> so um, I hear the issue on the corner, says Jennifer. Is there any chance of a mitered corner or other treatment? You know what I was wondering? Um, the Albini cardigan has a mitered corner and it's really, really nice. I've actually, that's one of my favorite things about that cardigan is the mitered corner. So I had thought about taking this off and taking off the collar and then redoing the button band and then doing the mitered um, and just following the instructions from Albini. Cause that actually, uh, the mitered up here has been like, one of the best things about that cardigan. It just means that it doesn't sit at quite a right, at quite so much of a right angle. It just kind of, it just feels right, if that makes sense. So yeah. Oh, Charlotte, you're so sweet. It looks immaculate from my chair. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I just wanted to know what you guys thought because I was looking at it the other night and I was like, I don't know, am I tired? This just doesn't, it just doesn't look right. But I appreciate that you guys think that it, that it, uh, that, that it looks okay. Uh, Diane says the right buttons could make or break it. I totally agree. And actually I, I don't have them yet, but my plan is to put on quite neutral buttons that would just really kind of blend in. I, I don't think that this is the type of sweater with all of that texture. You don't want anything that's going to compete. Um, I, I think something really rustic, really quiet, really muted just would, would be perfect. So yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Heather. She says in the end, you will be the one wearing it. If you don't love it, you won't wear it. Um, it's funny because actually these types of cardigans like this one that I'm wearing and, and this type of fit, this type of cardigan, that's part of the reason why I chose it. I wear them all the time because they, you can just throw them on and then throw a shawl on over top and you're good to go. So it actually, I will, I will wear this. And I just, I just wasn't sure. Like, I just was like, I don't know. Oh, waffle buttons would be perfect, Diane. That's a great idea. Yeah. There is so much texture with the waffle pattern. Perhaps part of the visual uh, uh, not looking right is that it feels too busy. Yeah, actually, you know what, Jennifer? That's a really good point because it's, um, it is hard to kind of, like I'm looking at the sweater in the background on the, on the screen here. It's, it is a lot of texture and it's hard to kind of know where to look. But when you have that framing of the collar, the button band, and then the bottom ribbing. It does kind of finish the sweater, but I'm really curious about that mitered button band, uh, uh, collar and maybe going back and changing that. So I'll, I'll keep you guys updated. All right, let's go into community participation.
So um, Jennifer had a great idea. She says, make waffle buttons. That's not a bad idea. Um, I could totally do that. Um, and then uh, Dorothy has a really great question. This is, uh, thank you, Dorothy, for asking this. This is a really great question. She says, how many sweaters do you have on rotation in your wardrobe? Um, you know, I actually think that's a really good, a really good question, actually. Um, I, it's, it's, it's a little bit comical because like I know I've knit a lot of sweaters over the years. Um, in terms of sweaters that I actually have in rotation right now that I'm actually wearing, um, that I wear all the time. So I wear my Albini all the time. I wear this all the time. Um, I actually have lived in my Cat Bells cardigan for the last week. I almost wore it this morning just because, just to show you guys how much I've been wearing it. Um, but I ended up wanting to wear this one because I wanted to show you the, the button band. But I wear, I wear, I've worn that this past week a ton. And my mom saw it and she was like, I really like that. So I've actually ordered yarn for her and I have, um, um, I'm actually um, going to try to knit it for her for Christmas. It probably won't be done, but I'll give it to her sort of mostly finished under the under the tree. Um, I wear my um, Willamette a lot, and I just found a big hole in it. Um, that, But I wear it more of like a jacket, um, so it gets worn in the fall and the spring quite a bit as a jacket when I don't need a jacket jacket and I, I just need a sweater in the morning. Um, I've worn my Magnolia Bloom quite a bit. I've, I've kind of kept that as like a camping sweater. I still need to lengthen it a little bit, but I've worn it a lot. The other one that I have worn a ton is my Spark cardigan, mostly because I'm just so proud of it. Um, I need, and then it's coming up to December, so my Jingle cardigan will come out into rotation. And then what my the one sweater that I have worn more than any other sweater that I've ever made, besides my Solaris, I've worn, I wear my Solaris almost weekly, um, multiple days, is my pink velvet. But James grabbed it one night and pulled on it. He was mad, he pulled on it, he grabbed it, he was trying to grab at me, and he broke the bind off at the back. It's that woolen spun yarn, and um, I don't have any more. I looked and looked and looked. So I actually need to rip it back two rows and then recast it off to fix that. Um, because he's actually like torn the bind off. So, which is kind of too bad because I wear it all the time. Um, the other cardigan that I wear a ton is my Gentle Morning. So those are kind of the big ones that I wear, and those are the ones that are like in rotation all the time. I still wear my A Day a lot. That one was by Cirilla Rose from years ago. I wear that one a ton, and I wear my Solaris a ton. Those two sweaters were like, they were big wins for me, and I wear them all the time. The funny thing is they're both knit out of Cascade Ecological, which is kind of funny to me. They're both knit in the same yarn. So yeah, I do have quite a few that are in regular rotation that I do wear uh, quite often. So yeah, it's not, not a fair question because Rachel rips out and reuses the yarn. <laughs> She's actually knit 4,251 sweaters. <laughs> it's true, Diane. Actually, I had a really lovely conversation with my friend Mona um, at Knit City this past fall. And she said to me, she's like, I really appreciate, she was being really sincere and really serious. Um, she said, I really appreciate that you rip and re-knit and get the fit stuff right. Because she said it empowers me to do the same thing. And so, and she said like, cause she's a knitwear designer. And she said, you know, if I have stuff um, that I haven't, um, you know, that I've designed or that I've worked on or that I've made that I'm not really happy with. She's like, I just remind myself that it's okay to rip it out and do it again and, and do it properly. So, um, to get that look or that fit that you want. So, um, I will continue to rip and re-knit and through December, you guys, um, will laugh because every single show will probably be recorded me with me wearing my Christmas sweater. Cause it's like the one month a year I can wear jingle unapologetically every day, all month. <laughs> so look forward to that. Um, all right. So, uh, community participation. This one is from Sue. I love these colors. So this is breeding color study on Jacob. We're just finishing up in December, our Jacob study, and we will be moving on to a new study in January information forthcoming. Uh, me and Katrina are organizing that for you guys. Katrina's working very hard on all of that. This is from Sue. I'm powering along towards the finish line over here. I started out with 300 grams of white, 100 grams of gray, and 200 grams of black Jacob comb top. 
She added in sari silk and English lister locks for color, which I think is brilliant, and dyed some of the white into all the inspiration colors from the original kit. I've posted photos in the past of the various bats I blended with these raw materials, and I've been spinning these off and on over the last few months. My goal is to knit the Tony cardigan by Coco Knits, and here are a few in progress shots. And actually, if somebody wants to link the Tony cardigan by Coco Knits, that would be awesome. Isn't that beautiful? The the one that I love the most is the when when they're in the balls is the um, the photo just cycled through, but the the two that are on my side, so on the on as we're looking at the screen on the left hand side, the two that are in the top corner. Um, I just love those ones. And I think there's a photo of one of them. Yes, here on the bobbin. I just love this with the sari silk and the Lister long wool. I think it's just beautiful. Well done, really pretty. Uh, Emily was wondering, um, what about your poet? Do you wear that much? I don't think you ripped that out. No, I didn't, but it ended up being quite form fitting and quite close fitting. And um, the reality is I've gained weight, which is a good thing I needed to um, after participating in a study um, uh, about 22 months, uh, no, uh, yeah, 20 months ago, um, where I had lost a whole bunch of weight um, as part of the study. Um, I've gained the weight back. And so the cardigan, like that poet sweater was knit quite close. And so now when I put it on, it fits but it's close fitting. Um, and so it's kind of ended up being one of those knits where I refuse to knit, I, I refuse to pull it out. But I have thought about passing it along to someone else. Um, I actually have thought about passing it along to my friend Jenny, um, just because she's that little bit smaller than me, it would just look amazing on her. Um, but I, I haven't kind of pulled the trigger yet because um, that, cart, that sweater took so much knitting. However, I actually plan to knit it again. So hopefully the second time around it'll, it'll go a little bit quicker. The Solaris pattern was, yeah, it was a shawl, kind of a shawl collar. Um, you know what, while we're talking about it, Jennifer, I'll take a pause and I am going to link my version of it in the live chat for you because honest to goodness, you guys, I wear it so much and I modified it so that because the original pattern is quite a bit bulkier, the shawl of it is quite a bit bigger and it was quite, um, it's just a big, a big cardigan and I really loved it, the look of it. And so I actually modified it quite a bit. So my notes are in, are in that, um, they're, they're there. And then the A Day was the other one that I, that I've worn an absolute ton. So it's there as well. Um, I wore that a ton, but all of those other sweaters that I made at that time, I've, I've, uh, donated all of them. Um, I wear my Willamette very, a lot. Um, that one's here. And what else do I wear a lot? Um, I wear, where is it? I just saw it. I wear my Nanook a lot. That was a really popular pattern for a while. This is the other one that surprisingly I wear a ton. It's called Opposite Pole. Pole. It's by Hohi Locatelli. I wear that one a ton. And actually those of you who are in spin group on Tuesday mornings in our virtual spin group together, um, you guys have seen that one quite a bit over the years. Cause I've worn that quite, quite a lot over the last, like I, I, I've just always worn it a lot. So all right, onwards. Uh, this is from Brittany. I love this, partly because Brittany is just so cute. Um, so she's, uh, she blended this pulled roving and it is magical, containing the Tansy Gotland BFL Icelandic Twins I've shared about before, Nora's Fleece, which was a Gotland, Brown Alpaca Navajo Churro, uh, Corridale Hand Dyed Baby Alpaca, Hand Dyed Merino and Silk. So a real like kitchen sink of, of fibers. Spun it woolen, full draft, two ply, my default. The pattern is a test knit for uh, crafting Kraken made called the Rain Toque. And I have to admit, I, I can't wait to knit this. I love this toque so much. You can see the beads in the tips of the crown, double brim and excuse me, sorry, and adorned with a faux fur, a fox fur palm ethically harvested here in Yukon. The, this toque has squish, a bounce, and is so very warm with that double brim. I think this is fantastic. So if you go into like Itsy Bitsy Yarn Shop in White Horse Yukon, um, they have uh, fur pom poms that are ethically harvested and a lot of the animals, they were roadkill. Um, and I had a whole conversation with the owner of the shop um, because I felt like living in Vancouver and being living in the South that I just wouldn't be able to wear it. And um, if people asked me if it was real fur, I would have to tell them and then I'd have to go into the whole story. 
and I just kind of felt like down here with all of this stuff down here and not understanding about Arctic life and about what happens in the Arctic and, and so on and so forth that I just couldn't purchase a, a fur palm. But I really appreciate that there are others that are, that are, um, able to do that and able to wear this stuff and, and understand the ethics behind it. Um, because these animals are a lot of, a lot of them are roadkill and the, the pelts would just be left, um, to rot. So at least they're being used, which is wonderful. And if anybody has any questions about the, about that and about those programs, um, definitely reach out to, I'm, I'm going to kind of put you on the spot, Brittany, but reach out to people like Brittany and people like Rebecca, um, who live in the Arctic and, and understand about this stuff and they can really help you to, to piece it together and understand. I think that's really important um, because I think it's wonderful. And Zero to Hero. This is from Laura. So this is, um, I tested, I test knit Anna, jo uh, Anna Joanna's, uh, I think it's called Veka cardigan in my hand spun. So it was carded thin, not a very nice prep as it's meant for felting and some drops kid silk. I wanted to share this because I thought this is a great pattern for smaller amounts of hand spun. I totally agree, Laura. Together with commercial silk mohair. Uh, this one is for my daughter, but I'm planning to knit one for myself too. The pattern will be published in March. Beautiful. Well done, Laura. This is from Glenda. I love this so much. I'm not sure if Glenda's here today. I'm not sure if I've seen her name or not, but I, I'm sure. I, I hope that... Uh, uh, I just, I love this so much. So I knit this, she said some, um, I was inspired by Rachel's Spark of Grey shawl. So I made my own. The contrast color is 18 micron fine merino two ply that I spun at 16 wraps per inch, 426 meters in 48 grams. Amazing yardage. Uh, the main color is a commercial yarn. So I, um, knit this I cast it on the week that my dad was made palliative and so I kind of this is terrible you guys but I call it my death shawl um I wear this all the time um I I just I don't I, I think it's just the pattern is appealing the 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 effect at the end is appealing the that big uh rib at the bottom to finish the shawl off like there's just everything about this this pattern is appealing I just love it so much and the effect of the sparks throughout the cardigan or throughout the, 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 um, the pattern, I just love it. I would love to see this in a cardigan. I would totally knit it. <laughs> I think it's just fantastic. So yeah. All right. This is from Liz. Hang on. Do I have Liz here? Where is Liz? I've got it all mixed up. Oh no. Where's Liz's? Um, um, this is Liz. I just didn't rename it. Sorry, you guys. Um, my sweater spin isn't done, but it's getting there slowly. I'm in love with this yarn. It's a sport weight BFL cross with just a touch of bamboo and alpaca and Angelina. Isn't that beautiful? Love that color. Beautifully done, Liz. Thank you for sharing. This is from Megan. Uh, Megan was in our maker morning actually this past week on, uh, on Wednesday morning and she was sharing with us another sweater that she's just recently finished. And I threw it into the, um, uh, Slack channel actually under the hand spun pattern in um, uh, inspiration thread because it was beautifully done. It would be a great, it's just a great sweater that she was wearing. And then she's got this one that she just posted. She says, I'm not capable of taking pictures of myself without making an awkward face. So this is why my head is cropped out. <laughs> I'm excited to share my completed Terra Nova sweater. Isn't this incredible? Look at all that color work. Just amazing. Um, I am so in love with it and so proud of it. Absolutely, Megan. This is just incredible. If somebody has the Ravelry link for this pattern, if you want to throw that into the live chat, because this is just an awesome sweater. So spinning, sampling, and play. Um, the creation of something new is not accomplished by the intellect, but by the play instinct from Carl Jung. This is from Sam. I can't stop smiling when I look at this yarn I have spun. It is alpaca merino silk 50, 30, 20. It's spun like a dream. I split the braid into three and the colors when, when lined up look like a fractal. Spun into three, onto three bobbins then plied quite high twist to hopefully make my sister some cozy socks to wear when she is, um, I'm not sure what that word is, but when she's um, on the sofa, I just love the pops of color, the browns and orange, just zing gifted to my lovely, by my lovely friend Eve, too bad she doesn't like orange. Isn't that an incredible braid? Incredible colors. Amazing. 
Yeah. Jennifer says about Megan's uh, sweater um, here, she says, I am so impressed with the color work, right? That's why I had to share this with you guys. I just thought it was unbelievable. And I don't know if it's knit in panels or like how it's done so that you put the lace in there too. Like it's just a shocking sweater. So this is from Becca. I had to share this with you guys because Becca is such a beautiful spinner and she's such a beautiful uh, knitter. Um, my first cast on in, no joke, 20 months. What better way to recapture some mojo than with hand spun mitts? Uh, plus the chilly weather makes it so much more fun. The yarn is a Shetland Polworth blend three ply that she spun back in 2019, she thinks. Isn't that incredible? I love that, the look of the twisted rib with that yarn. It's just beautiful. I hope you get your mojo back, Becca. This is from Dion. Since I've returned home from Guatemala, I knew I had five days before shoulder surgery. I got tons of spinning in and even more and even made this bat for some play. I sandwiched in coral with sparkle between four shades of blue and an outside layer of black with some sparkle. A week after my surgery, I was able to start spinning it. So I hope that you're feeling well, Dion, and I hope that you are uh, well on the road to recovery. Um... Uh, cooch. Oh, okay. Thank you, Eve. Um, cooch is pronounced cooch. <laughs> um, so that was the word um, that I was trying when she is cooched up on the sofa. It's um, Welsh. Is that right? Yeah. Oh, here. So Megan says it's knit all in the round with lots of steaking and it's called Terra Nova. That's that sweater by Megan that we're all talking about. This is from Julie. This is so much fun. South down wool in south down colors, chain plied for my sock study. I believe my feeling today is properly chuffed. Isn't that incredible? Those colors are amazing. I remember there was a breed, uh, there was a uh, fiber club one month, uh, one month that was um, from Sweet Georgia when I was spinning it every month for them. And it was these colors and I have a chain plied skein that's basically the same. And I saw this that when Julie had shared it and I thought I've got to pull that skein out and do something with it because this this skein is just beautiful. So I need to uh, I need to do that. This last one is from Amanda. Um, a bit of transformation. A sad faded cardigan got frogged, and I over dyed the yarn with uh, with Kutch. Uh, now you've got me all mixed up, um, Eve. With Kutch, um, it is now a lovely nut brown color with hints of pink in some in some lights. I promptly made a crocheted shawl from, from it, um, the After Midnight Shawl by, by our friend Charlotte Lee. Char this, this was um, a collection of crocheted patterns, shawls um, that Charlotte put together for, well, I don't think it's only Charlotte that is the designer. Vicki, maybe you can speak to that. Um, but it was, um, uh, Charlotte did, did a bunch of the designing for the shawls and, and she's, she's a friend and I, she's just wonderful. So, um, it's called the after midnight shawl. Um, definitely my kind of color now. It just looks amazing, Amanda. Well done. So we have a lot of alongs going on in the community at the moment. So there's like the spindle spun stitches. We've got the 51 yarns group B is just finishing up next month. Their two year spin along. We've got the luxury fibers along and we've also got people working on their weaving. So I've linked all of those alongs in the show notes and you guys can have a look if you are looking for some inspiration, looking for some projects and stuff to work on. So that is it for today. Thank you so much for um, being here today. Thank you for taking the time out of your Saturday morning to watch and to um, participate in the live chat. Um, yeah. Oh, Vicki, I was right. Yeah, it's all Charlotte. Um, she's very talented. She does the... Uh, uh, introduction to crochet videos on the School of Sweet Georgia too. Uh, she's just the cutest thing. So have a wonderful week. I hope it has uh, been restful for those who are in the States and had the weekend off. And I hope that um, you are all invigorated to get back to things next week and uh, have a wonderful rest of your week. I can't believe that we are almost into December. It is just too much to bear. Um, so next week will be the beginning of December. Before we say goodbye, um, I wanted to mention that starting on December 1st, so that's this coming Wednesday, 
for the first four Wednesdays in December, um, we are going to have a maker morning every Wednesday morning. So it will be every Wednesday morning at 6.30. So if you are a patron of the community, watch for the Patreon post announcing with the link for the maker morning. We are going to do them a little bit differently through December. So the first four weeks of December, so we're not gonna do the fifth week because it'll be after Christmas and nearing New Year's and that can sometimes be a really busy time for people. There's still family stuff going on. So it's just the first four weeks. So rather than having two maker mornings, we're gonna have four. They're gonna be an hour long, just like our regular maker mornings from 6.30 till 7.30 Pacific in the morning. However, they're going to be a little bit different. So instead of having an hour long to chit chat, the first half hour, everybody will be muted and everybody will just be working on their stuff. So that's why we're having four. It's an opportunity to work on gifts, year end stash dash, uh, projects that you're trying to get finished, stuff that you're trying to sort of work through and get done, get off your wheels, get off your looms, get off your sewing machine, whatever it is that you need to work on. That first half hour will be silent. Everybody will be muted. There will be no talking. And then at at six at seven o'clock, so halfway, um, so we'll have half an hour of quiet. And then for the next half hour, um, we'll go around and everybody can share what they're working on. So, uh, or what they were working on and what they're working on for the month. So um, it'll be a chance to really like get some stuff done and not to, we're not gonna be sort of sitting and chit chatting in our reg, like, like we normally would. And I will not be recording the first half hour. So the first half hour will just be people working and then you're not making on your own. You're not making like by yourself. Um, and um, and then the second half the the second half hour I will I'll record that and we'll put that into the Maker Morning playlist for patrons to sort of see what people are working on and what they're trying to get finished for the end of the year. I know that not everybody gift knits, not everybody gift spins, not everybody gift weaves, but people do often want to get things done for the end of the year and they want to have things you know sort of tied up and bobbins free, needles free, looms free for for the new year. So that's what we're going to be doing. So that will be starting on Wednesday, December 1st. So when you come into the Maker Morning, it will be silent. No, no mics will be on. And for that first half hour, it'll just be quiet making. All right. So I will hopefully see you guys on December 1st on Wednesday morning. And until then, happy spinning, happy weaving, happy knitting, happy all the things. I'll talk to you guys next time. Bye.